This project is supported, in part, by a grant from the Chatham Cultural Council, a local agency supported by the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Everything told of the sea, even when we did not see its waste or hear its roar. For birds there were gulls, and for carts in the fields, boats turned bottom upward against the houses. Sometimes the rib of a whale was woven into the fence by the roadside. The shores are more fertile than the dry land. The inhabitants measure their crops not only by bushels of corn, but by barrels of clams. Henry David Thoreau. Hundreds of years, New Englanders have fished the way that their fathers and grandfathers did before them, using hooks and lines to harvest a seemingly endless supply of codfish and haddock. But with the crash of these traditional groundfish stocks in the 1990s, each year fewer and fewer longliners remain. Captain Mike Anderson is a good example of a longliner who has profited despite the last 30 years of ups and downs in the fishing industry. After graduating from college in 1968, Mike moved to Cape Cod to make his living in what was then a much different business. Four or five years ago, some longliners like Anderson decided to take a chance and fish a non-traditional species, the dogfish. Until recently, fishermen have viewed the dogfish as a trash fish, a nuisance that could ruin a day's work by beating the cod and haddock to the baited hooks. When you catch them, you really catch them. And we used to, that used to happen by accident, where we would go down the shoals and it, you'd think you were setting on codfish and you would get a dogfish and every hook, and of course you'd lose the whole trip and your gear would be a mess and, and you'd be insane. But it dawned on me one day, I said, well, you know, if you could catch them like that, you really, you might make some money even at a dime. You know, it just seemed feasible. We were, and we really didn't have an awful lot of alternatives. We had a lot of bottom left and there wasn't a lot of codfish and it seemed like, we could try it. We figured we could put it together a short money on our end and see if we could turn a profit, and we could. You know. The Northwest Atlantic spiny dogfish is one of the oldest species of shark, first swimming on the scene over 200 million years ago. It is a highly migratory species that is found in Cape Cod waters between spring and fall. They group together in massive schools, 
and will eat just about anything, feasting on crustaceans, mollusks, and any number of fish species. Because dogfish eat constantly and indiscriminately, a dog fisherman can catch huge numbers of them any time of the day. Dogfish live up to 40 years and reach lengths of three to four feet. Female spiny dogfish begin to reproduce when they're about 10 years old, and like humans, be alive young after a full two-year pregnancy. True to their name, they're armed with a sharp spine that local fishermen are constantly aware of. During the 1990s, demand for dogfish fillets and British fish and chips has transformed them from an unwanted pest into a catch almost as viable as codfish or haddock. Generally, Mike is up and navigating the channels to the open sea before anyone on land is even sitting down to breakfast. But today he's heading out later than usual, just as the remains of the morning fog are burning off. He's heading to a place the locals call the Old Tuna Grounds. Mike maintains close radio contact with other longliners to monitor the location of dogfish within the area. About eight miles from shore, he approaches Mike Kiernan and Kenny Eldridge on the longliner Amy Margaret. They're already hauling back their hooks and lines. Because you can set anywhere, and because you, the, you don't need to um, fish certain spots like you do in ground fish, you have to pretty much be on the spot or you don't catch anything. So that's very competitive. People try to get to the spots before you or after you or, you know. But in this particular business, if you find them, and they're not worth an awful lot, you know, you try to help the other guys, everybody. And also you try to stay out of each other's way because if the gear takes off and flies into somebody else, it's... So you pretty much have to be in some kind of, uh, you have to continually be in communication as compared to any of the industry. Minutes later, Mike comes upon another longliner. This time it's the William Gregory, captained by Roger Horn. Traditionally, Chatham fishermen go out in pairs, but in recent years, economics dictate that men like Horn and Anderson now choose to go it alone. It just isn't enough money to, to, have a, to put a crew on. I mean, I did fish with a crew. It just it doesn't come out. It just really isn't enough money. I had crews for a long, long time you know, when, when fishing was good, and you really needed a crew. But what happened was that um, eventually the fishing became so poor for a while that you really couldn't make enough money to support it. It was a, it was a, a pressure to have a person with a family dependent on you to make money. It was, a, it was a difficult thing to have to call somebody in the morning on, in December or January and say we're going to go fishing and then not make any money. And that's a hard, and I, I've started feeling the pressure, and I, I'm sure a lot of captains did, of people who really, really needed the money. And so you, I, I would go on conditions where I thought that, that I knew for a fact that I shouldn't be going. That kind of led to, to going by myself. And I just went, just went. And, and I found out I could do it, that it wasn't so difficult. Hours pass and the morning progresses into afternoon, but the Atlantic remains as flat and calm as a tidal pool, making it easy to forget that this is no pleasure cruise. Mike is here to find dogfish. It is late spring, so the dogs are further offshore and they tend to school higher in the water column than they will in the fall. Mike scans his fish finder. This time of year, they'll show up in the monitor as tightly bunched chains, 
while later in the fall they'll show up as yellow blue lines along the bottom. Mike also keeps one eye on the water. There is activity all around him. Humpback whales splash playfully off the starboard side. The old tuna grounds are a big flat stretch of mud where thermoclines and bottom formation attract concentrated schools of bait fish. In the spring, the area comes alive with humpbacks, finbacks, minkies, white-sided dolphins, and every manner of seabird. Under the ocean surface, schools of fish, including the dogs, are feeding here, and that in turn is what draws the many fishermen. Everyone, man and beast, is here for the same reason, the food. Large draggers from New Bedford and Gloucester crisscross the vicinity, never a welcome sight to a longliner like Anderson. We were all afraid of draggers, especially when we were fishing in the, in the spring because we were right in the dragger country, right on the soft bottom there, which is their domain. And um, if they're towing in that area, then you, you've got to stay well clear of them because they'll tow you up. But they don't seem to understand what we're doing anyway. If you talk to them, they just seem to be bewildered. By, by the idea that, that you're out there long running for dog fishing. And when you talk to them, they just seem to be confused by the whole thing. So I can see that you kind of have to keep a real close eye on them. They think we're gill netters. They always call and say, the gill netter ahead of me. And I always say, well, no, I'm a long liner. But they don't do that. They don't, they don't fish with a little skinny line and they fish with big gear, terminal gear, you know. So this, you can usually get around that stuff so far. After five hours of patrolling the grounds, Mike catches the telltale chains wandering across his fish finder. It's time to set the gear, a process that has remained relatively unchanged for generations. fishermen ventured out onto the rich fishing grounds of George's Banks aboard large schooners. Once there, two-man crews rowed out from the mothership aboard small 16-foot wooden dories to set long trawl lines equipped with numerous baited hooks. Because the lines of trawl were stored in circular tubs, people used the terms longliner or tub trawler to describe the men that used them. To set the gear, the dory men threw a barrel, line, and anchor, which was attached to two or three tubs of long line. The anchors weighed down the string and the barrels were used to mark the set. The lines were pulled hand over hand into the boat where the fish were removed by one quick motion of the wrist. After a few laborious hours, the fishermen returned to the mother ship. But it was not always an easy affair. Handling the fish-laden dories could be dangerous as the gunnels were commonly down to within inches of the waterline. And some dorymen never made it back after disappearing into a fog bank or being taken by surprise in a sudden gale.
the longliners no longer fish in schooners, the basic process of setting and hauling the baited hooks remains unchanged to this day. Before Mike headed out for a day of dog fishing, his baiters were hard at work to prepare the gear. Depending on the price of dogfish, Mike had his baiters use either squid or herring. Squid is preferred because it stays on the hooks better, but herring is used on days like today when the price of dogfish is low. Each fish tote contains bundles of 250 hooks, and Mike ties together three or four of these totes to a string. Once the line is set, it will only be a matter of minutes before it will be full of dogfish. The faster Mike can make his way back to the baited line, the less chance there are for problems like tangles or damage to his gear. When his last anchor catches a stern, Mike releases it and heads back to the first set. He runs the starboard side of the bad dog over to the uptied flag of the set. He grabs the flag, feeds the line into the hydraulic hauler, and cranks it up, letting it free fall into coils in the tote so the bait is unsure can better deal with it later. He allows the boat to drift down on the tide and tries to keep up with the gear. Speed is the key to dog fishing, and from here on out, things on the bad dog are a little more frantic. Mike moves speedily down the lines, yanking the dogs from the rollers just as the hook is pulled from their mouths. He steers one-handed and tosses the dogs over his shoulder with the other. Where they land is not all that important, since by the end of the day, every square inch of the boat will be needed to bring them all back to Chatham Harbor. Amidst the flying hooks and dogfish bodies, Mike keeps in the back of his mind the many dangers that accompany anyone working alone at sea. dangerous. There's no, it's not a question that you're, you're there by yourself that, it, that it's dangerous. If you get hurt, you're going to, I mean, you're, you're by yourself. So you, you, you keep that in mind. You're working with hydraulics are un, very unforgiving. Hydraulics are, are, are really a terrifying thing because if they don't know you're hooked and they don't care. So, so you have to stay clear and keep your head all the time. Um, you know, if you do get a hook in you or get tangled, they have, they have every ability in the world to get your appendage off if they decide that that's what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So that's one very real danger. The other real danger is not being in the boat anymore. You, know, you, should, you have to keep it, pay strict attention to stay in the boat because with no one else to help you back in or if the water being terminously cold, you can, probably wouldn't take long. I used to always say that it's analogous to fishing in sulfuric acid by the time it's January or February because you only have a couple of minutes in the water, life expectancy isn't too long. So you I mean you got to make a real, you know, you got to really make a stab at not going in the water. <laughs> Those are, you know, you have to make a few concessions to the fact that you're alone. I don't. Know. Other than that, other than this, you're fishing on sulfuric acid and everything's trying to kill you. <laughs> it's nothing to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
On the next line, Mike is set on very bad bottom for long lining. The uptight anchor fails to hold in the soft mud, and the numerous hooked dogfish have folded the usually straight long line back on itself, generating a huge tangle. Whole bundle. What a disaster. Whole bundle. We were setting in very bad water. Not not ideal for line trolling. It's very soft water. So, I mean, you, you, those kind of things are going to happen. I mean, it happens. It happens to everybody who goes line trolling one time or another. You have tremendous tangles. But I mean, all the the whole consequence of it is to get it in the boat and deal with it on the shore. I mean, it's it's just a tangled line. It's, you take all the hooks off and and you can untangle it fairly rapidly. The fish buyers make it clear what size dogfish they will accept, and after catching literally hundreds of thousands of dogs, Mike has no problem telling them apart. Some of them, of course, go right back in the water. Only one bundle wasted. You know, you try to get an acceptable size. You know, there's a, there's a size that you can, after a while, like anything, you've been looking at them forever, you can tell which are not acceptable. So you just release them, but that's the, the beauty of long line is they're alive, and you split their lip, but it doesn't seem to bother them because you catch them all the time with split lips. It doesn't bother them at all. So, yeah, I mean, that's the one thing you can say is that if they're too small, you just snub them off and let them go. And they, they're enormously resilient. And you find them all hacked up. The draggers cut their noses off to get them out of their nets. And they, you catch them all the time with no noses. And so they seem to be having um, recuperative powers. Soon the tangle is put away in one of the totes, and Mike makes quick work of the remaining strings. Commercial dog fishing has increased nearly sixfold in the 1990s, and some scientists warn that the long time spans needed for the females to reach reproductive maturity, the long gestation period, the birth of few young, and the commercial targeting of the larger adult females may combine to make dogfish a species that requires some measure of conservation. But long lining itself is a low impact, sustainable way of fishing. It's, it's a very passive fishery. It doesn't ruin the bottom. The bait, I mean, if people understood what, what long lining for, for ground fish was, if they understood, it only, the bait only really fishes for five or six minutes. So environmentally, you're not tearing the bottom up, you're not destroying the habitat, and you're there only a short, very short time. And you do, if you're careful, have the ability to release the fish that you are unwanted. I think, I obviously think, and I think everybody would agree, that if everybody had stayed long lining forever, there would be, all the fish that were here would still be here, because you could never catch them as fast as they could be reproduced, and, and um, it would have been a viable fishery, but that's not how human beings do things, and I understand that. I mean, we needed the fish, and people needed to catch them, so they caught them more efficiently. When the last line's hauled and the last flag's put away and, and the, the last dogfish caught and the gear's all used up, I go home. There's no sense of staying. <laughs> all you're doing is asking for trouble. <laughs> when you're out there by yourself long enough, it's, you're asking for trouble, you know, so you might as well go home. You know, and I suppose the quicker the better.
just lets it be a movie star, you can get out and help. Overall, the trip was a successful one, and the deck is heaped with dogfish. To many people, the boat might not be a very pretty sight, but Mike has had plenty of time to come to terms with this aspect of what he does. The part of being a fisherman that is the most distasteful is that you actually kill things. I mean, uh, farmers kill things. I suppose guys, people who pick or orchids are killing things. Um, you make your own, you make your own um, peace with that, whoever you are. I mean, ethically speaking, you, you have to have come to terms with your own life long before you did this. I, I'm not a callous person. I'm not a killer of things. It's what I do. You either participate in life or you don't. I mean, some people think that because they hire assassins to kill their meat that their, their hands are clean. It's not true. That's not true. I mean, it just so happens that I'm a fisherman. I always have been. I, I suppose that I could have been a librarian, but that's not what happened. So participation is, I chose a long time ago to participate in life. And that's how it is. The dogfish are unloaded in thousand pound lots. Then they're iced down and brought into the truck, which will soon be headed to the processing plants in New Bedford. From there, the fillets will be packaged and shipped to the United Kingdom, where they are called rock salmon and eaten as a mainstay in fish and chips. While catching up with the others at the pier, Mike washes down the bad dog after the day's work. Every day that he covers fuel and expenses and is able to put aside a little something for himself is a good day. Today he's landed 6,000 pounds. A profitable day despite the tangles and the low prices. If you really wanted to catch fish, you'd get a dragger and go catch them as fast as you possibly can and fill the drag up and dump them on the boat and go home, you know. So long lining doesn't really make sense in the, in the um, civilized world because it's a throwback to how they fished at the turn of the century. In reality, it doesn't make sense to do it. But there is an aesthetic quality to it. I mean, it's fishing. It's individual fishing. It's not, it's not hauling them up in a big bag. It's seeing them. They come up on a line, and, you, and, and, and there is something fascinating about it. And if you, if you, if you think about it, it, there's a certain kind of old beauty to it. There's something about it. You know, there's something about it that, that, uh, that's that satisfying. I don't know if dogfish in particular is satisfying, but long line in general is kind of a satisfaction in itself. And I'm fascinated by it, I always have been.